Welcome, everyone, uh, and thank you for being here. Um, I'd like to begin by first saying, uh, no matter where your political leanings are, we now have a president. Uh, whether you are in the U.S. or elsewhere, you have probably heard that just a few hours ago, uh, President Biden was uh, declared the uh, winner of uh, the presidential elections in the United States. Uh, so the people have spoken. Uh, so uh, I am uh, Huri Berberian, uh, professor of history and Merhouni family presidential chair uh, in uh, Armenian studies uh, and the director of the new Center for Armenian Studies at the University of California at Irvine. And on behalf of the Center for Armenian Studies, uh, we welcome you to the first part of a three-part series on Armenian communities in the Middle East today, uh, and we'll focus today on Lebanon. Uh, this series will be a very timely uh, and thought-provoking intervention during a, a tense time in Armenia uh, and the diaspora. Uh, by focusing on Armenian communities, uh, bro uh, broader questions regarding diaspora, minority politics, migration, and more will be examined. This webinar is part of the Bahe and Armine Meruni lecture series. We would like to thank the Merunis and also our co-sponsors, the UCI Department of History and UCI Global Middle East Studies. Of course, I am also grateful to our panelists uh, from across the world, uh, from Armenia, from the Netherlands, Italy, Australia, uh, and the US, from the East Coast and the West Coast, and especially to Tsolin Nalbantian, who helped me with the initial thinking and planning of the virtual salon. Uh, the webinar will proceed in the following way. I will introduce our moderator uh, and facilitator for this session, uh, Dr. Herag Papazian for this session. Uh, Dr. Tsoli Nalbantian and Dr. Joan Nucho will take will make 15 minute presentations. Uh, then Dr. Papazian will then moderate a discussion among the presenters and all of the panelists. After which we will open up the virtual floor to questions from the audience. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to send uh, to write down and send in your questions. Please make sure your questions are questions. Uh, please, no comments. Uh, it helps us get through the questions a lot more easier if uh, they are questions uh, rather than trying to switch, sift through comments. Uh, be clear and concise. That also helps. Uh, I will briefly now introduce in alphabetical order all of our uh, panelists today. Uh, and in greater detail, uh, Dr. Papazian, our moderator, who will then introduce our two presenters, uh, Doctors Nalbantian and uh, Nucho. All our all our uh, all our other panelists uh, will return to give their own presentations in parts two and three in winter and spring quarter. Part two uh, will focus on Syria and Iran, and part three will focus on Turkey. So uh, both, of course, Armenian communities in these countries. Uh, at which point, of course, we will introduce uh, all the panelists, uh, each panelist, each presenter to you in uh, more detail. So panelists joining us uh, from across the US, Europe, Armenia, and Australia are James Berry, who will present on Iran in the spring, a research fellow at the Alfred Deacon Institute, uh, Deakin University. Uh, Marisa de la Gata, who will present on Syria uh, in the uh, in uh, winter. Uh, did I say uh, spring for James Berry? I meant winter. Uh, Marisa de la Gata on Syria in winter as well, adjunct professor of political science at the University of Bari. Harut Ekmanian uh, on Syria uh, in winter, international lawyer and attorney in New York. Tsoli Nalbantian today uh, on Lebanon, Assistant Professor of Modern Middle East History at Leiden University. Joanne Randa Nucho uh, today on Lebanon, Assistant Professor of Anthropology at Pomona College. Harak Papazian on Turkey uh, in uh, spring, lecturer at the American University of Armenia. And last but not least, Christopher Sheklian on Turkey in spring, director of the Krikor and Clara Zohrab Information Center and adjunct professor at St. Nerses Armenian Seminary. Uh, now for a, a more detailed introduction of uh, Dr. Herat Papazian uh, before he takes over the reins. 
Her Papazian holds a doctoral degree in sociocultural anthropology from the University of Oxford. Uh, in fact, he just received his doctorate uh, in 2020, so congratulations. Uh, he has extensively researched Armenians and Armenian identities in contemporary uh, Turkey since 2014. Apart from teaching at the American University of Armenia, Papazian currently conducts a multi-sited ethnographic research between Istanbul and Armenia, together with his colleague Salim Aykut Öztürk. Funded by an EU grant, this research looks into issues of dual citizenship and processes of mobility from Turkey to Armenia. Papazian's research interests include social boundaries and their making, politics and activism, ethnicity and nationalism, religion, migration, and diasporas. I welcome all of you, uh, and I hope to have a very productive and fruitful discussion uh, today. Thank you for being here, and I will now uh, uh, hand uh, the reins over uh, to Harag, and uh, from now on, I'm just going to call you by your first names. I hope you don't mind. So Harag, please take over. Thank you very much, Dr. Beberian. Um, welcome everyone and greetings from Yerevan, from Armenia. Um, so as you already know, today's session is, uh, is about Lebanese Armenians or Armenians of, um, of Lebanon. Um, uh, Dr. Nalbadian will cover uh, will cover some of the history of the community, um, and then uh, Dr. Nucho will uh, will concentrate more on the current issues uh, Lebanese Armenians are facing. Um, before I, uh, I uh, before I, I I invite them to present, let me quickly um, introduce them in more in further detail, um, and let me tell a few a few lines uh, a few a few words about uh, the, the topics they're going to be discussing today. Um, so Dr. Tolin Albadian is Assistant Professor of Modern Middle East History at Leiden University. She is a historian working on the social and cultural history of the Middle East. Dr. Nalbandian is co-series editor of Critical Connected Histories uh, from the Leiden University Press and has published articles in Mashriq and Mahjar in Mesa Review of Middle East Studies and History Compass. Her book, Armenians Beyond Diaspora, Making Lebanon Their Own, was published last year, that is in 2019, by Edinburgh University Press. Dr. Nalbandian today will be talking mainly about the Lebanonization of Armenians and its implications, but also about the sectarianization of the Armenians of Lebanon, about how Armenians have profited from the sectarian system of Lebanon and the implications of them also being, becoming sectarian. Our second speaker today is Dr. Joanne Randanujo. She's an anthropologist and filmmaker. She's the author of Everyday Sectarianism in Urban Lebanon, Infrastructures, Public Services and Power, published in 2016. And assistant, she's an assistant professor of anthropology at Pomona College. Her films have screened in various venues, including the London International Documentary Film Festival in 2008 and Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions in 2017. Today, she will be discussing Bushamut, as a particular kind of working class Armenian space in Lebanon. But also about Burchamud uh, being not only as Beirut's Armenian culture, but also a diverse working, working class space that is home to Lebanese of other sects as well, and also of uh, migrant workers from around the world, including Syria. Dr. Nucho will also discuss the current Lebanese financial crisis and the further issues created by the recent explosion in Beirut, and importantly, their implications on Bouchamoud and its people. So um, I now invite Dr. Nalbandian. Um, Dr. Nalbandian, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Harag, so much. Um, and thank you, Huri, for bringing us together. And uh, also thank you, Dwayne Pack, for bringing us technologically together. Um, and thank you to the UCI Center for Armenian Studies. Um, so I'm really excited to be a part of this panel um, and really these ongoing panels um, and to be a part of this particular team of colleagues and friends uh, engaged with Armenian communities globally. Um, and since this is just the first series, um, first part in the series to be held throughout the year, I'm looking forward to seeing how our conversations change, evolve, um, and really connect or don't to each other. 
And usually what's sort of, you know, a, a downer when you participate in a panel is it because it creates sort of a type of energy, um, but then it ends and then you have nothing to do with it. So I'm sort of, ex I'm extremely excited that we can hopefully take this energy and, and just move it to the next panel and that it doesn't end when our time sort of ends and then you don't know what to do. Um, so that's the great thing about, I think, this um, sort of series of panels. But perhaps we're all also thinking at the same time, and the audience included, you know, um, you know, what really brings these places together: um, Lebanon, Syria, Turkey, and Iran. And through our conversations, we actually connect these places, these experiences, these histories um, that maybe at first glance don't quite link. And I find it particularly innovative that it's us, and I mean us as us panelists, but also UCI as the facilitator for bringing us together, and you as the audience member, um, that we are actually making these connections through and by looking at these experiences and actions of Armenians. And of course, there's a corollary that I hope is adopted through these conversations. And that's that when we think of these places, we automatically think of Armenians. And that when we think of Armenians, we automatically think of these places. And I say this not as part of some nationalist endeavor or because I want to force the insertion of Armenians into conversations of Lebanon, Syria, Turkey, Iran, or elsewhere for that matter, but simply because Armenians have been an intrinsic part of these societies and they are intrinsic parts of these societies for some time now. And yet we're often left out of their histories and their imaginations. And while I'm going to be talking about Lebanon today, I think that we can easily expand this to include other geographies. So why is this? Why has this been the case um, that Armenians have been left out of these national histories and national imaginations? Um, the first, um, I think, is um, you know, part of a def partly as a defense mechanism of the Armenian genocide. So in order to in an, in an effort to publicize the Armenian genocide and fight against its denial, Armenian historiography has created a robust library of works that center on the Armenian genocide. And this has tended to minimize local engagement of Armenians outside of the story and tends to treat Armenians elsewhere or globally only as victims of genocide. The second reason is perhaps a consequence of the first. So due to the Armenian genocide heavy works, national historiographies, so Lebanese for in this case, but also other, don't really consider Armenians beyond their victim status or at best beyond their status as refugees and thus reinforce an idea of Armenians being temporary residents and thus not integral to understanding the nation. And yet, both despite and because of the genocide, Armenians created political, social, ecclesiastic, cultural, and ideological centers of power. And today I'm going to be talking about one such center, Lebanon. But I also want to talk about the legacies and ramifications of that center. So just a quick historical background. While the Armenian genocide condemned surviving Armenians to a life outside of Anatolia, and destroyed Istanbul as the primary center of Armenian economic and cultural life, it also had other effects. For one, in Lebanon and specifically in Beirut, the remnants of Armenian communities hailing from myriad points all across Anatolia with the vast majority from Cilicia gathered in a single space. What had been multiple Armenian communities back in the Ottoman Empire's vast lands grew into, single, grew into a single community in Beirut. The community, was not hetero, the, the community was not homogeneous though, quite the opposite. It was extremely heterogeneous and in a much more high energy, involved, boisterous, vociferous, and indeed conflict-ridden way than Anatolia's Armenian communities had been. As important, Beirut, the Arab East's most thriving city from the, myth, from the mid 19th century, provided an energizing environment for political parties, church institutions, newspapers, and eventually radio stations and lay people to interact in the everyday in unprecedented ways. Early on after World War I, this process was facilitated by France 
Lebanon's mandate ruler from 1918 to 1946. A key event in this regard came in 1924 when the French included Armenian inhabitants of Lebanon in the new mandate citizenship law. That particular French act had a negative effect as it were. It legally nixed, or at least drastically reduced, the chance that Armenians would return to their former homes back in Anatolia. After all, they were now citizens of another national space. The Citizenship Act also had a positive, a constructive effect. It created the legal and by extension political framework for recentering much of Armenian life in and on Lebanon. Given Lebanon's sectarian system, after independence, Armenians were guaranteed political power and four main Armenian political parties, the Hunchak, Ramgavar, Dashnak, and Communist, jockeyed with one another to this end. I wanna pause here just for a minute. So yes, Armenians were Lebanized, and in order to participate in Lebanese political life, were accordingly sectarianized. So while Armenian political parties struggled with one another for power, in doing so, they were exercising or practicing sectarianism. The Armenian church in Lebanon can be viewed in a similar way. And here I'm talking mainly of the Cilician Sea, far and away the most powerful Armenian church organization in Lebanon. And while the Ottoman reforms punctured the relationship between congregant and religious authority amongst all Malets, and the Greek and the Jewish religious authorities never recovered in, in Lebanon, the Cilician Sea in Lebanon emerged strongly empowered. The French extension of citizenship to Lebanon's Armenians, the Cilician Sea's re-establishment in Antilles, and the Lebanese state's sectarian structure indeed encouraged ecclesiastic authorities to re-establish their presence in the Armenian community. In 1929, the Jerusalem Patriarchate ceded its authority over the Armenian communities in Damascus, Latakia, and Beirut, including their monasteries, churches, and schools to the Cilician Sea. By the 1940s, the Cilician Sea had established in Lebanon Armenian elementary schools, high schools, numerous churches, a seminary, and published journals. Furthermore, it acted as a key community intermediary to the Lebanese government. And by the same token, Armenians who otherwise could or would never have gotten involved in church politics now had the occasion to do so. In works that profile Armenians in Lebanon in the, contempor in the contemporary period, and mostly here I'm talking about Armenian historiography, the ramifications of the sectarianization are listed in terms of achievement, as if Armenians are an accomplished community because they are guaranteed numbers in parliament and governmental portfolios, including the cabinet. They're never labeled a sectarian one. And this achievement or visibility often translates amongst Armenians outside of Lebanon and often even within Lebanon as a point of pride. Videos or photographs of Catholicos Aram meeting with Lebanese government officials are shared and liked on various social media platforms. The movement of, me of member of parliament Hago Pakraduni, which, who's the head of the Tashnak bloc, is avidly followed by various Armenian newspapers globally, especially published in, uh, including published in North America and elsewhere. And yet we must pause to talk about Armenian complicity in the sectarian system that has created an environment rife of nepotism, corruption, neglect, and lack of representation for those falling outside of the Lebanese government's categorization of sect. Armenians in participating in the system empowering themselves through its structure and exercising their authority are likewise supporting a system that has embedded prejudice. So while we may celebrate the visibility of Armenians in Lebanese state structures and how that may manifest in everyday experiences or normal life in Lebanon, such as public visibility on April 24th, national holidays being declared for Armenian Christmas on January 6th, availability of Armenian food as part of Lebanese cuisine, an avid national following of home and men basketball teams, we must also speak about what that type of visibility, integration, and presence comes with. What comes with that type of power? Armenians in Lebanon, like other Lebanese compatriots, are culpable in the very system that they profit from. 
but an additional problem arises. They are culpable in maintaining a system that they also need. Themes of justice seem omnipresent right now in current global Armenian discourse. And I don't even know if that's such a thing per se, this global Armenian discourse, but I'm referencing the current protests, action drives, talks, conferences that have been organized um, in Armenian communities worldwide, drawing attention to the Azeri military assault on Harapahor Artsakh, calling for international condemnation of Azeri attacks on civilians, and the hashtag Artsakh Strong that has also been used globally. But if we're calling for justice in Artsakh, upholding a universal definition of, definition of the term, shouldn't we also concurrently be on the front line of justice in Lebanon? And if that's the case, are we prepared to actually lose visibility if, if real reform was to take place in one such Armenian center? And if so, would that in turn affect our ability to call for justice in Artsakh in the first place or anywhere else? I think we have to talk openly and frankly about how Armenians have profited from the sectarian system and the implications of them being sectarian and how that intersects with additional calls for justice and solid solidarity in the Caucasus and really anywhere for that matter. After all, if I want, you know, when we think about Lebanon, Syria, Iran, and Turkey, that we also think about Armenians and vice versa, shouldn't we do the same with the concept of justice? So when we think about justice, shouldn't we automatically think about defending Artsakh, but also calling for the end of such a such a sectarian system in Lebanon. So I think I'll end it there and hopefully I think we'll have more to talk about um, you know, during, the, during our conversation. So thank you. Thank you very much, Tolin, for the truly interesting talk. Uh, I'm sure many, uh, many of the uh, panelists, but also the attendees would have um, questions. Um, but before that, let's hear, let's hear what Dr. Nuho has to say. And so the floor is yours, dear Joanne. Thank you. Um, thank you so much um, for this wonderful invitation and this opportunity um, to speak to you today and to be in dialogue um, over the next few months through this series. I'm really excited about it and just um, so thrilled to be following um, you, Solin, after those really fascinating remarks and can't wait to talk about them really. Um, so I'm going to be zooming in in my um, comments and focusing um, on a neighborhood, uh, city, a suburb of Beirut in Lebanon called Burj Hamoud. Um, and, and I'm going to be talking about it and highlighting it as a particular kind of working class space in Lebanon, which is also um, often known throughout um, Beirut and throughout Lebanon as, the, as Beirut's Armenian Quarter. Um, however misleading that title kind of is, given the, the real demographic diversity. Um, but, but aside from being this kind of working class space, it's also known um, as a hub for retail shopping, for artisanal crafts and workshops, um, people making jewelry, leather goods, shoes and apparel, as well as um, repair shops of various kinds and me mechanics and machine repair. So um, though it's, like I said, it's often referred to as Beirut's Armenian Quarter um, because of its history, which I'll talk about in brief in a moment, um, and the fact that the municipality and many of its major institutions are run by Armenian organizations, it is, like I said, quite a diverse working class space um, that is also home to Lebanese of other sects and migrant workers from around the world, um, and increasingly also displaced people from Syria and elsewhere. Importantly, its status as a working class space and an industrial cluster where interrelated forms of labor, materials, and expertise work in tandem to mutually support businesses, it is a unique space in the, within the greater Beirut area, one that is currently under threat um, given the, the financial crisis um, and the further issues created by the, the recent explosion. Um, and yet, um, I, I'll hopefully have some hopeful statements to make within this as there are efforts underway and there have been over the past five years um, to look to the Burj Hamoud cluster in order to think about alternatives for development and support in the aftermath of so much crisis in Lebanon. So other, in other words, to sort of lift up what this um, industrial cluster really is, what it does, um, what its ramifications are spatially, socially, politically, economically, and think about 
um, sort of what it means um, to have this really vibrant space, um, which is residential mixed use. Um, and also until, you know, until kind of recent years had been quite um, successful in perpetuating itself through these small family businesses, what has happened to threaten this model? And, and what does it mean for um, this, this one small bastion of manufacturing um, in Lebanon? I mean, there are a few others, but this is one that has come under focus recently. What it means for many of these generational businesses um, to be dismantled and for um, the, the kind of new generation to either become employees in service sector jobs, which is sort of what's starting to happen, or to immigrate. And, and in turn, what this effect will have, not just on the Armenian community in Bush Hamoud or in Lebanon, um, but really on the country at large, right? Um, as the recovery has so often focused on um, bolstering the service economy, bolstering the presence of tourists, um, the real estate sector, um, the banking sector, the financial sector, right? Um, so this, this represents a unique view of a part of Lebanon that I think often part of Lebanon's economy that doesn't often um, really see the light um, in, in a lot of analysis of the country. So um, I'll back up a little bit and I'll talk, I'll talk about um, Burj Hamoud itself, its composition and a little bit about it, its history. So it's, it's, even though it's a separate municipality, it really is one of Beirut's suburbs. It's just on the other side of the Beirut River on the east side. Um, it is one of Beirut's most densely populated suburbs with a population of 150,000 people estimated in an area that comprises about one square mile. Since there has been no census conducted since 1932 for reasons we can talk about in Q&A, um, which have to do a lot with the sectarian system that uh, Tzolin was talking about earlier, um, these are all estimates, um, population estimates, but to put it in proportion, the population of the greater metro Beirut area is about 2 million. The over overall population of Lebanon is usually estimated at 4 million. And um, as at least um, the last time I checked the statistics of how many registered Syrian refugees there are in Lebanon, at least according to the UNHCR, and of course, these are registered, not official number, counts of how many displaced people there are, there were over 1 million. So that gives you a sense of kind of what's been happening in Lebanon over the past 10 years. Um, there could be close to 2 million, actually. I've heard that that's a conservative estimate. So Burj Hamoud itself is a, like I said, it's a popular residential, commercial, and artisanal area um, that was first urbanized through the joint efforts of Armenian town associations and French mandate officials who were eager to move Armenians out of refugee camps and into more permanent housing in the 20s and 30s. So um, Armenian town associations with, um, at the time, you know, purchased what was then kind of agricultural land east of Beirut um, and built the first structures in what would become the municipality of Burj Hamoud eventually. Um, keep in mind that most of Beirut's periphery, which is now densely populated suburbs, was then agricultural land. Um, layers of, of paths are deeply embedded in Bush Hamoud's neighborhoods, many of which still bear the names of these town and village associations. So there's a Nor Sis, Nor Marash, um, Adana, and other parcels of land, other sub-neighborhoods within the city, which are named for these town associations. This municipality has, like I said, long been dominated by Armenian cultural, political, and religious organizations, though it is quite diverse um, with people. And when I say migrant workers from all over the world, I really mean all over the world, um, from you know, Africa, from South and Southeast Asia. Um, you know, it really is a very diverse working class neighborhood in that regard. Um, while there are processes that link the municipality leadership affectively and materially to kind of larger transnational Armenian diasporic organizations, migra migration patterns, remittances, and movements, the municipality and its actions are, are very much a part of the Lebanese political sectarian landscape. Um, so while organizations that might be perceived as more cultural in terms of their activities in other locations in the diaspora, they are highly political in um, the Lebanon context where they act as political parties as well as key purveyors of public goods and services like education, medical care, and security. 
Um, one of the aims of my book, um, which came out a couple of years ago and focused on ethnographic research in Bush Hamoud and its environs, was to think more seriously about the relationship between infrastructures, services, and notions of sectarian community and how one comes to feel a sense of belonging and even a sense of one's identity. These infrastructures, things like electricity cables, um, bridges and roads, um, do important sensory and symbolic work in addition to their technical function. Just as they serve to create spaces of connection and conjoined action, they also serve to differentiate, subtract, or reroute people and things. While urban infrastructures and the processes of sectarianism are produced across scales of governance and geographic scales, complicating dichotomies between the local and the transnational, they're also rooted in very ordinary, everyday material ways um, that people experience in their everyday lives um, in a neighborhood like Bush Hamoud. And I felt that a focus on you know, how people live in their everyday life worlds, how they relate to problems of how do I get medical care? How do I get a scholarship to send my kid to school? How do I get electricity flowing all the time? Um, that these, quite focusing on these questions sort of denaturalizes the idea of community as an unchanging already there construct, but rather highlights how it is really a process very much connected to the material process of building the city. And uh, you know, I would argue now with this, this focus I'm hopefully going to, to zoom in on in the artisanal cluster, that it also is very much connected to the local economy and people's forms of livelihoods. And the fact that so many Armenians in this neighborhood and, other, and members of other Lebanese sects too, other communities in Bush Hamoud, so many people have these generational family-owned businesses. And what sort of happens to the, the spatial and social and economic um, sense of community when people become employees rather than small, you know, owning their own generational family businesses and passing on these forms of know-how. And that's a question we don't really know how to answer yet, but we're starting to see it happen. Um, so for many of my interlocutors, um, of course, it's more than just the, the material goods and, and exchange of material things moving around that constitutes a kind of infrastructure. Um, it's also the density of Armenian institutions, the sound of Armenian being spoken, um, Armenian music echoing through the narrow streets, and the presence of Armenian script on signs and posters, which helps to create the special sense of Bush Hamoud as an Armenian space, even as it is a, also a diverse space. It is precisely this proximity and density of Armenian institutions that helps to create an infrastructure that channels feeling and urban, urban memories into a feeling of whatever it is to be a part of the Armenian community in Lebanon, or one one version of it, right, in this working class community. Um, and I share an anecdote here from a 25 year old at, who was 25 at the time when I interviewed him, um, who grew up in Bush Hamoud, who told me that as a young child, you know, three, four, five years old, he actually used to think he lived in Armenia and was confused that there was, wait, is there like two Armenias? So, so convinced was he of the world he was living in. Um, being an Armenian sphere of some kind, right? That he had this abstract sense that the neighborhood of Bush Hamoud was a kind of Armenia for him. Um, and he recalled that kind of laughing and said, you know, that's, that's how total the experience felt when I was a really small child and the circle that I was in and the, the, neighbor, the specific street I lived on and who my neighbors were at the time. Um, so, and, and I'll also say one thing I'll add is it's not to bifurcate the Armenians in the neighborhood from, um, you know, like just to mention that there are also Syrian Armenians in this neighborhood and their relationship to the Lebanese Armenian community is different to other Syrians, obviously, who come, who have been, who come as migrant workers, who come for um, now because of the conflict, they've been displaced um, and, and their relationship to the community and that sense of Armenianness creates a kind of bridge, which doesn't mean there isn't any differentiation but has made their experience of migration kind of different, um, at least in the early years of the conflict, um, which was when I was doing most of my field work. Um, so I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna kind of move into a project that, talking a little bit about a project that I am currently collaborating on 
with um, researchers that are currently in Lebanon. Um, Sarin Agopian is kind of the lead there. She is a recent um, AUB graduate of the architecture program um, and a, just a wonderful, brilliant researcher who's done a lot of work on the industrial cluster in Bush Hamoud um, over the past five years under the aegis of a cultural organization called Bat Ger, which is um, in Bush Hamoud. And um, she's collaborating with a few um, resident researchers, and also one of them is a small business owner, Khajag Barsumian and Ani Mardirosian. I want to name them here as you know, very serious interlocutors and co-researchers on this project um, that is really focusing on neighbor neighborhood development stories in areas impacted by the recent explosion. So what we're kind of trying to do in coordination with others at AUB is think about um, you know neighborhood by neighborhood. How did not only did how did the blast impact places like Bush Hamoud, but how were the trends that were already in place in the years leading up to 2020 and the financial crisis of the last year? How did what how how might those trends continue? How might the blast accelerate them? And what are some possibilities for recovery um, after this moment? Um, you know, what are the spatial ramifications? What, what does economic recovery look like aside from, you know, the questionable outcome of an IMF loan, right? Um, what is it actually, what, what can be recovered from this? And what had already, what are the valuable things that might be lost unless they are supported um, throughout this crisis? And so um, through, you know, really through Sarin's experience um, in doing really focused research, um, her, her suggestion was really these, these industrial clusters, right? And because she saw how important the interrelationship was between um, continued residents and um, people's intergenerational businesses that were struggling now more and more, um, not just because of the financial crisis of the last year, there had been sort of an ongoing trend having to do with um, imports and um, just, you know, lowered, lowered possibilities for really making ends meet and for making these businesses profitable, some of them more than others, depending on the sector, um, that she really saw, you know, a, a crisis in the making of what would happen when these generational businesses did not continue anymore. Um, so importantly for this, you know, to add to this conversation today and to think sort of historically, I keep talking about generational and family owned businesses. It really is remarkable that many of these knowledges um, and businesses are like are 80 years old, right? And so they've been um, persistent um, uh, through these family connections for almost 100 years. And that is really something remarkable in and of itself um, and, and really is sort of baked into the fabric of this city. Um, so like I said, it's, it's a hub for artisans, craftsmen, and skilled workers. But what I didn't realize until I started collaborating with Sadin is that it, they constitute actually the largest percentage of local businesses. Um, and apparently, this, this, um, these are all kind of new to me, these, these ways of thinking about these businesses and their interrelation. But apparently, they're known as an organic cluster model in that um, the businesses in the neighborhood complete the, are complete value chains from um, the production of raw material to end ma manufacturing and selling. Um, so when you look at what it takes to actually have a, a, a jewelry business, it's not all done in one house. There's someone in the neighborhood who is an expert in cutting and, and placing diamonds, and that's all that he does. There's somebody else who um, is an expert at some other kind of laying or um, manufacturing of particular metals, right? And all of these um, sub, you know, small businesses within this um, very close proximity support each other, right? So there, there is competition, but then there's this also this very unique um, cluster of manufacturing that doesn't exist in very many places in Lebanon, I've learned. Um, so I know I always know, knew this about Bershamud, but I'm learning now just really how very valuable and special this um, this uh, manufacturing cluster is, and, and just how endangered it is after 80 years of successful um, generational transmission. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna just play for a minute a very short clip from my film that I made in Bershamud, just because I think um, it'll be interesting to show people what one of these businesses look like. 
I was really taken with the experience of touring many of them or just, you know, meeting people who worked in these sectors when I was um, doing my field work. And this particular scene um, is in a shoe workshop. So I'm going to go ahead and attempt to share my screen here and hopefully, um, hopefully do it right. Um, okay. Okay, and you all have to tell me if I if you can't hear it because we had this issue last time. <laughs> no. Okay. Let's see. I'll stop and try again. Okay. Here we go. I see what I did wrong. All right, hopefully this works. Amen. <laughs> Um, so that particular shop, um, unfortunately, the man interviewed there has since passed away. Um, his son is carrying on the business. It moved locations because it was located in the informal Sanjak camp, which was the basically the last remaining of the refugee camps in that part of Beirut. Um, although the people living there, um, that's another long story. We could talk about it in Q&A. Um, but basically, that business has continued, and they have carried on. Um, but many of the generational businesses, um, the younger generation, the new generation, doesn't want to carry them on, doesn't see the prospects that their parents and grandparents had um, in that sector, the, the reducing margins and profitability. And now um, the whole crisis of the currency devaluation um, has just been a real blow um, to a trend that had already been going on. Um, but, you know, I end with, without really any findings yet, but just a number of questions um, about, you know, what will happen um, more broadly when people shift from being owners of their own businesses to being employees. Um, what will happen to this neighborhood? Um, what will happen to um, not just the economy, but also that, like I said, because there's this real interrelation or entanglement between these material infrastructures and the, a sense of community, um, what will it really mean for this really vital part of Bursh um economy to, to sort of collapse? Um, and what will it take to think about these industrial clusters or these manufacturing clusters as something really worthy of saving, not just for some kind of sentimental reason, but really because it represents um, a successful, self-sustaining spatial um, model for crafts that are pretty unique um, and that really are, can't be found just anywhere. Um, and I know I didn't spend a lot of time showing you images, but um, really a lot of the things that, these handmade things that, they, that come out of Bush Hamoud are just absolutely stunning and they build on 80 years of know-how and expertise. Um, so I think that the, the hope of people like Sarin and others who are doing research around this um, is to find a way to um, lift these up as an important part of Lebanon's potential recovery um, and what it might mean for the country to really think about supporting um, their, their artisanal 
sector and the manufacturing sector as small as it is um, and, and what it has meant or what they've really sacrificed by favoring um, services, real estate, um, tourism, and other things like that. So I, I end kind of with some tentative questions and some maybe small sliver of hope um, that this, you know, wonderful tradition um, of, of, of craftsmanship um, might find a way to continue. Um, and certainly there, some of the young generation is really trying to do so. So thank you so much. I look forward to Q&A. Thank you very much, uh, D. Joanne, um, for sharing with us um, some some parts of your uh, still research still in process, um, and for your very interesting insights. I'm sure. Um, well, I have I have a couple of questions um, to both presenters, um, but I'm sure I'm, I'm sure that also uh, many other or maybe even all, hopefully, of the um, panelists have their questions as well. So I will start. I will start by posing only one. Um, it's directed to uh, both of you because you both spoke about um, sectarianism and the sectarian system uh, in Lebanon and, and about how the Armenians also um, fit into that system and even use that system um, for their own political and communal uh, you know, um, survival or profit, um, generally speaking. But I and especially when, especially also talking about the recent crisis, um, I, I could not but think of 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 the following uh, of of the of the movement generally political movement in Lebanon recently rising political movement towards um, towards a secularization uh, further secularization of course it's it's legally to some extent a laic uh, country um, but you know doing away with the uh, with with the sectarian system and also uh, Tolin hinted at uh, at the possibility of it um, I wonder what uh, what you think um, the implications of such a possible, such a potential uh, future uh, would be. Uh, and apart from the implications, uh, wh whether you or how much, uh, how much of that political movement can you observe within the Armenian community of Lebanon? Myself being from Lebanon and although not there since, since seven years ago, uh, following the news, but also being in touch with, with, with friends and family there, I, can, I could witness during the last decade increasingly um, that even Lebanese Armenians, some Lebanese Armenians are more and more interested um, in uh, more in more generally Lebanese politics and Lebanese, uh, and, and the Lebanese identity versus uh, or even in opposition to uh, narrow uh, sectarian politics and maybe maybe we can even talk of uh, of um, just creating this term of a Lebanization as well um, of some of the Armenians of Lebanon in the sense of acquiring that Lebanese identity uh, in opposition to um, you know, Armenian Lebanese or Shiite Lebanese or Sunni or you know sectarian identities. Um, so, any ins insights you would have on on this process generally and on the implications this could have on the Armenian community and on the Armenian Lebanese identity generally. Um, I'm I'm just interested to hear what you think about these these, these things. Um, Joanne, would you like me to start first or, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a, thank you, Harag. Um, it's a lot <laughs> to think about um, as a response. Um, so maybe I'll just say a couple things um, and then uh, pass it on to, to whoever else would like to sort of continue. Um, I mean, of course, I'm not just hinting at the fact, I'm stating that, um, you know, if you want to, uh, um, change the system, the sectarian system, it would mean loss of power for the Armenian community. Um, and that makes people uncomfortable. And I, um, sitting here, can't say that that should be done, right? Um, uh, you know, in, in my position. Um, but um, at the same time, given the fact that um, Armenians globally are interested in talk about justice, uh, with regards to what's happening in Artsakh and for the Armenian genocide, for that matter, um, uh, you know, recognition for the Armenian genocide, I think that there should be, um, you know, some 
obvious for me it's obviously intersectional but i under also understand that people don't want to do that right because it would mean um, a loss um, of power. Now, what kind of power though, one has to ask, right? So maybe the loss of power is okay because it would be the loss of, um, the, you know, um, of presence in the sectarian system, right? Um, but um, I can't speak for um, members there. And I, I, I also think that there's obviously an issue of class here um, and that, um, you know, uh, you know, Joanne will know far more than me uh, with regards to like, you know, present conditions of the Armenian working class now and how they would feel about suddenly losing whatever representation, whatever that may be, but that they have it at all, right? Um, in some type of structure, right? So the known is better than the unknown, so to speak. Um, you know, so, uh, um, you know, I think that that is uh, certainly an issue. And just one last thing, um, I don't know if secularization would be the opposite of sectarianism. Um, I think that secularization often is um, seen as uh, some type of neutralizer, but for me, it can also be seen as just an additional sect, really. Um, you know, or just an additional type of religion, um, but cased differently or frames differently. Um, and I, 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 I'm hesitant about that. Um, so, but those are just sort of my initial thoughts. Yeah. Thank you, Tolin. Uh, Joanne, um, would you like to add something? Yeah. Those interest yeah. Uh, that's a really interesting question. It's something I've been thinking about. Um, and actually, I, I was reflecting a couple years ago, I wrote an article about um, the 2015 garbage trash protest, the You Stink protests, and what I saw as um, the potential for, and this is why the infrastructural angle is to me kind of important. Um, I saw in that moment of breakdown of an infrastructure like trash, which doesn't have an individualized workaround, like when your electricity goes out, you can buy a generator for your building. When you don't have water coming out of the spigot, if you have money, you can buy, you can buy water from a truck and fill the tank on top of the building. And I've done those things. So I know I haven't bought a generator, but I bought Ishtidak. So, you know, with trash, there was a unique situation where for the not for the first time, but there was a spectacular breakdown that could not be individually hacked. Everybody in Beirut was smelling the trash, seeing it on the street and watching it build up. And I think it struck a chord and it allowed for the a kind of infrastructural citizenship. Um, I'm quoting Kyle Shelton here, who's an urbanist working on the States um, to emerge in that moment. And for people to actually feel able to say, um, this is not about one of the factions. This is not about blaming one specific party. It's actually the entire structure of governance that is a problem here. And what I contrasted it with was the protest that, had, and there had been a few of these, and I remember there being at least one when I was in Lebanon, that was framed um, something like, we want the fall of the sectarian system. I'm translating somehow from what I remember. And that protest was not very well attended because the demand, I think, especially for people for whom everyday, for whose everyday life experiences is about navigating between clinics, agumps, you know, political clubhouses, um, you know, that 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 is their network to 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 then demand for that to be gone before there's some kind of functioning social welfare net. And I'm not even saying it's that um, it's that like. Uh, rationally parsed out, but that, you know, for the moment of the garbage crisis to occur, for that spectacular breakdown to happen, and for there to be an opportunity for everyone to kind of point to something and say, that's what's broken, I think it allowed for there to be a consciousness about the situation without necessarily making that about identity consciousness, right? Um, so I, I guess I turn away from the idea that one needs to denounce one's membership to a community in order to be appropriately Lebanese or appropriately oriented towards a, a better version of citizenship. Um, and instead, I think whatever might be emerging or could be emerging should be um, or can be observed in practices that already exist. Uh, so the forms of 
um, neighborhood neighbors helping each other, the forms of economic social interrelation that have always existed. And that actually, according to Suad Joseph's amazing research in the 70s, the sectarian parties actually kind of broke apart, right? So there was, in Bush Hamoud, there was a great deal of, of uh, cooperation between working class women's networks, which she documented very well in her ethnography, that actually the sectarian parties specifically targeted. So in, a, in an interesting way, if you wanna talk about class, Look at labor practices. Look at the labor practices of mutual aid and neighborhood um, cooperation that you do kind of still see in working class neighborhoods. Instead of waiting for the moment of class consciousness to be the spark. And I think that's sort of what the infrastructural breakdown moment of 2015 helped me think about. Not that I have some kind of prescriptive, um, but, but very early on in my research, I had a very smart Armenian um, a mentor of mine um, who said to me, well, what do, you, what do you think is better, American cult multiculturalism? I mean, we see the problems with um, people being made marginal in a system which, you know, pretends to a certain version of democracy, but in fact has within it baked in inequalities. And he, and he said, I don't think that's necessarily better. And that, that was a kind of a wake up call for me for what a normative um, progression that I imagined should be the case. Um, and, and I think that instead kind of looking at what's already there, rather than imposing upon it this idea of, you know, what's the wrong kind of belonging and what's the right kind of belonging, um, you know, towards this teleology of a citizen and a nation state, which maybe isn't even like such a great model, um, is, is maybe a better way of challenging that. Um, so I don't, I don't know if I have an answer, but I think I have some good places to look. Um, I wonder if I can bring uh, everyone in uh, with a question that uh, Tony asked, but I want to see if we can uh, have everyone uh, sort of come in uh, regarding their the communities in their in their own countries of specialization. So uh, one of the things you said, Tony, was about sort of the uh, culpability of uh, Armenians in maintaining the system in Lebanon, the sectarian system in maintaining um uh, the system so if they're invested in in justice but they're maintaining the system are they really invested in justice and to what and then obviously this is this may be controversial uh for some but so i'm wondering can we apply this very question or this very idea that of the culpability of armenians in maintaining the uh, sis, the sectarian system in lebanon can we apply this to Armenians perhaps maintaining in some ways uh, systems in other places. I'm thinking, for example, the Assad regime in Syria, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or exactly. I mean, right, in the, in the uh, you know, in Iran's case, uh, you know, maybe not the Islamic Republic, but the Pahlavi regime, not maintaining it as if like, you know, they were the ones responsible for it, but, you know, for, you know, being, uh, you know, take, you know, uh, benefiting from it in many ways. Uh, Turkey perhaps is a different case, but maybe, you know, uh, Chris and Harad can, can speak on that as well. So Marisa, you jumped on it, so I'm, I'm going to give you the floor. <laughs> Thank you, yeah, I was keen to elaborate on, uh, yeah, this idea of maintaining the system. So we know that uh, the majority of Syrian Armenians support uh, Assad's regime. Uh, but of course, this is again a kind of uh, uh, prejudice everybody uh, has towards Armenians because uh, again, we cannot uh, generalize. Uh, and uh, uh, I asked uh, this question to them, uh, yeah, to the Syrian Armenians I interviewed. And uh, I could see that uh, is, um, there is a variety of opinions uh, on even uh, on the possibility of a regime uh, change. Uh, so, uh, and again, uh, I would like to uh, elaborate on what Soline was saying on uh, uh, secularism and um, this idea that uh, secularism is a new form uh, of religion, uh, which uh, I totally agree with because uh, this is what we see, we actually see uh, in Syria, we have uh, a secular system. Um, uh, 
uh, Armenian support because uh, they know that uh, it might guarantee them a, for, a form of political uh, representa representation. Uh, so again, a regime change uh, would imply a, a loss of power for Syrian Armenians there. But then um, this particular form of secularism in Syria Again, we're, we're calling it a form of religious uh, secularism because it's a form of secularism that tends to uh, emphasize uh, religious uh, belonging and also religious participation, so political participation uh, based on, uh, on religious belonging. Uri, may I? Yes, um, Oh, sorry, Hug. Um, uh, okay, I, uh, I, I'm also. Uh, I, I, I would like to also add some points on that, um, and uh, probably points of discussion. I would like to hear everybody's views on that. Um, uh, I think there's a also, there's a difference also between uh, the capabilities of a group and uh, when they are also on the receiving end of some benefits from a certain system. Uh, so th these are two different categories. We shouldn't really uh, mix them together. Um, and also uh, when living in a very difficult region in like the Middle East, uh, sometimes we fall into a trap of pinning too high ex moral expectations uh, from, uh, from the political leadership of uh, such vo volatile uh, small communities. Um, I think this is an important uh, issue that we need to address when we ask these questions. Um, can I jump in at all? Or Harag, do you want to talk? Um, no, no, please go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so just building on this conversation, also on questions that came up for myself in Soling and Joanne's presentations. Um, one of the areas of interest that I've always had is the relationships that Armenians have with their other ethnic groups within their own environment. This is something that's particular to Iran. And this relates to this whole, um, the maintaining of power, the power structure in, in the sense that for Armenians in Iran, I guess the similarity with Lebanon is the representation in parliament. There are two members of parliament. Uh, that's sort of considered a joke by some um, and also something ser a serious protection by others. But generally you find the more conservative forces the church and the Tashnaksagan, but I mean, that's a broad term that people use for those that run the organizations. They tend to be supportive of that idea of maintaining these, uh, these people in parliament. Whereas those who are a little bit, who are not part of those, uh, those institutional structures say, well, we're part of Iran. We should be voting in the main ticket, not for, uh, members of parliament who don't do very much because they're really there as a rubber stamp for the Iranian government to say that we represent our minorities, uh, that they're kind of like, um, yeah, window dressing in a sense. So there is that tension. And this also relates to uh, labor relations. And I'll be interested to hear about how this works in Lebanon because you do have the Armenian business owners who are kind of a, uh, I guess, a, they're a, a, a petty bourgeois class uh, who have their own interests within uh, the economic structure and having a stable political system. And uh, they they would be more reliant on a, the status quo remaining. Whereas then you have a, a working class, those who don't own their own businesses, who are more interconnected with other uh, groups without other ethnic groups who work alongside them, who have a very different view about what the future of a political system in Iran would look like. So um, I'll be interested to hear what examples with Lebanon and Syria if there are similar examples there, because um, that's just something I've noticed in the Iranian case. Maybe um, presenters on Lebanon and Syria could um, respond to these questions before we um, turn our attention towards Turkey. Yes, uh, class uh, intersects in, in a sense with uh, sectarianism. Uh, and so, but I think it's a, a very difficult question on, about how the two interact. Um, and uh, I could see 
Yeah, what James uh, was saying also, um, interviewing Syrian Armenians uh, in Armenia. Um, so, uh, but again, uh, this form of a peculiar form of repatriation caused a, a form of, uh, in a sense, lowering uh, the class status. So this uh, also changed uh, political perspectives. So a form of declassation, let, let's say. So they were declassed uh, in the move from Syria to Armenia. Mm. And this uh, implied a, a change in their political perspectives. Um, can I, I actually have a question. Um, yes. Sorry, uh, Harag, thank you. Um, no. Actually, to James and Marisa. So James, why is it a joke to have two members of parliament? Um, is it not enough? Um, like, you know, and, um, or is it because they're often a rubber stamp? And um, it, yeah, sorry. sorry, go ahead. No, 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 you, you first. And then just, I have a quick question for Marisa too, yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, basically because uh, they're supposed to, according to the constitution, they're supposed to represent um, however many th th tens of thousands of citizens. So I think it's one member of parliament per 60,000 citizens or something. And the reality is that there's less than 30,000 Armenians left in Iran. So for people, it's like uh, this is a, a window dressing for the Iranian government so that when the president goes to the United Nations in New York, he can take the Jewish member, the Armenian member, the Zoroastrian member, and that's essentially what they're for. They're there for public relations. Now, in reality, those members of parliament do other things as well. Uh, they help um, uh, minority uh, members of the minorities with their children who with conscription. If they want to avoid conscription, they help with that. They do other things as well. The members of the community get arrested. They tend to be the ones to intervene. But uh, in terms of actual political involvement in the day-to-day -day, uh, workings of Iran, they don't have any real effect. And so that's why you get a particular political stream within the Armenian community who said who say you need to vote for local politicians who do have a say in the parliament, not because they're Armenian, but because they're actually going to represent your interests. That's, that's the idea. Which in that way is quite, it can be quite similar in Lebanon, right? Because like the, the, the portfolio that is given often to Armenians is like the portfolio of sports, right? So it's not like foreign ministry. It's not like these hard portfolios, so to speak, you know? Um, yeah, and, and Marisa, when you were saying, so if I understand you correctly, you're also sort of saying that um, uh, Armenians, uh, Due to it, uh, due to the movement to Armenia, Armenians from Syria due to movement uh, have also changed their political persuasion. Yes. Okay, and domestic yes. political persuasion, like vis-a-vis -vis the Syrian government, not vis-a-vis -vis yes. Armenian political parties. Uh, both of them, yes. Okay. In, in they, what way? Uh, yeah. Um. Uh, yeah, the movement made them less conservative. Um, okay. Yes, and um, yeah. and uh, yeah, if I can add maybe a question to the to the panel, um, uh, I found really interesting the idea of having two Armenians. Armenians, uh, Joanne uh, was uh, referring to, uh, quoting from a, an interviewee, um, uh, but uh, what? I found was that there are actually three Armenians. So you have the imagined uh, homeland, and then the the real homeland, so which is Armenia, and then the the, the Armenian community in, uh, in this case in Syria, in, Le in Lebanon, Turkey, and so on. So yeah, I would like to uh, I would love to hear what everybody else has to say about this. Yeah. Um, uh, Marissa, I, I, I want to ask you a question about the, uh, about the change of perspectives within Syrian Armenians uh, in Armenia who moved to Armenia and became less conservative. What, what do you mean by less conservative, like less conservative politically or socially? And uh, also is this conclusion based on a large scale survey 
Yes, yeah, on a large scale. And uh, yeah, both socially and politically, because uh, the uh, repatriation uh, sort of uh, made them rethink re of their identity, their Armenian identity, and even their role in the Armenian community. And then also politically, yeah, uh, to rethink of their political support, yeah, to, towards the status quo. So to be more clear, are they now not supporting the Syrian regime? Uh, like in, in, in a large number, in yeah, a large... Yeah, I mean, there, yeah, when we talk about Syria, it's so uh, highly polarized um, pro-anti-regime. Uh, let's say that uh, the majority still supports the regime, but they are now questioning uh, the nature of the regime. So they're now recognizing that it's an unjust regime. And well, so, I can yeah. add to that that it's not just the uh, yeah. Armenians who left to Armenia. I, I can testify to that for uh, non-Armenian Syrians who are inside Syria yeah. are are already on that level at the moment after suffering years of uh, uh, years without uh, any basic services uh, with government failure. Uh, so they have already reached to a to a level of that magnitude in, within, within Syria. Uh, well, I'm not suggesting it's uh, threatening the existence of the regime or whatever, but uh, well, I'm just to draw. Uh, line between where both communities, Armenians who left the country or non-Armenians who are inside Syria, Syrians, um, in different places, in different realities, but probably coming to the same point at, the, at some level because of, uh, of uh, very similar experiences. Maybe you can add uh, more perspective to that. Let me um, let me echo um, the point Marisa was making about um, multiple Armenias or three Armenias, uh, maybe even four Armenias. In fact, um, if if we we should uh, we can add to that, especially in the case of um, Lebanon, but probably also well definitely also Syria, but also other uh, diasporic communities. You know the old Armenia, the historical Armenia, which is of course ceding to some extent its its importance gradually. It seems to be ceding its importance gradually um, to current day you know independent Armenia and uh, Artsakh, Karabakh, and so on. Um, I think uh, Joanne wanted. To to say something, did I see your hand? Yeah, I, I wanna say something about this doubling, tripling, quadrupling, because actually I think there is, there's infinite numbers because, um, so my grandmother was a Hajansi. She grew up in Hajin, which is the neighborhood just on the Beirut side of that river, dividing Beirut from Bushamud. And so through her, I used to attend here in, in Southern California, in Pasadena, the Hajansi's uh, annual uh, commemoration of the fall of Hajin in, in what is now Turkey. And for her, it was really interesting at there, the first time I attended and I went with them when they were cooking and stuff, she and the other people preparing. And when they were talking about Hajin, they were slipping in between Hajin Beirut and then things their parents had told them about Hajin Hajin. And so it was really interesting to me that then, you know, the, the layers of where Hajin went and what it meant. And of course they had a, they have a magazine. They're, they're a, they are, um, the descendants of this town are all over the world. They have a compatriotic association, which many of the other towns do too. Um, and so to me that this, but the spatialization of this, it meant that it really wasn't just um, whenever people got together. It actually referred to some specific places in Beirut in Pasadena even, and um, also from what I understand in Argentina, <laughs> and and in Hajin in what is now Turkey, right? Saimbeli, they've renamed it, right? But there's tours of Armenians who go to these places where their families have descended from. So that that was interesting to me. And and I, I've also heard there's a Nord Hajin in Armenia, which is really an interesting path. So I think what you said, Marisa, is really correct because um, I've often heard, and this is a little outside of what I've done a lot of research on, but I've often heard people tell me that 
um, going to Armenia is such an interesting experience of sometimes recognition, like seeing Ararat instead of on a calendar, and then being there and having that vision challenged by uh, a reality which is never what one imagines, right? Um, and how many, you know, refracted and um, bounced images of whatever these Armenian homes are from these town associations and their specific iterations in the diaspora to, you know, the recentering of, or not recentering, well, however, I, I'm not sure exactly how to say this, but the fact that for people of my grandmother's generation, Hajin was an orientation, and I'm not so sure that that continues. And what does that mean for that orientation of origin to be fading? Um, so it, it, it becomes interesting to see the relationship between origin and copy, if you want to put it that way, is, is totally um, different now um, and is multiplying. Can I just add something with that, Joanne, which is very interesting about the Iranian case, which is different because there isn't that post-genocide community as much where people can trace to an Ottoman city. So since the fall of the Soviet Union, there has been a movement amongst some Armenians in Iran to use the village dialects that were spoken in central Iran, Iran uh, southern Iran, northwest Iran, to figure out where those villages came from in Armenia itself by matching with dialects in Armenia. So there still is that sort of, uh, not obsession, but that interest in genealogy and figuring out where we came from and where is our home in Armenia. So, uh, it, yeah, I just thought that would be interesting just to add that. Um, yeah, and since, yeah. Please, Sorry, Hrag, I wonder if Chris or you have um, anything to add. We sort of went away from the uh, question, but I thought maybe you guys wanted to uh, add something to the issue of Armenia. Yeah, that's that's uh, what I was. <laughs> that's what I was going to say, especially that we reached uh, somehow geographically Turkey or you know historical Armenia. Yes. <laughs> um, so maybe maybe we bring the Armenians of current day Turkey in, Chris, if you want to talk about the system and how they fit the system or, you know, whatever. Sure, yeah, I've, I've got, I mean, this has been such a fruitful conversation that I've got a lot of thoughts. And I would just say my internet is a little unstable. Apparently the rain in California has confused everything. It's so rare. Um, First but, of the so season. If I, if, yeah, if I, if I get a little shaky, then uh, let me know. But um, yeah, this has been a really incredible conversation so far. And I'm, I'm really got my mind in a few different directions. Um, but maybe... Uh, with, without thinking about these sort of overlapping geographies that I think is worth really keeping in mind, Joanne, the way that you've described it, I think is really wonderful. And I, I think about that a lot where uh, I come from and where I'm, I'm sitting very close to actually right now in Central California, my, my home parish is, is called Yetem, um, Eden, um, and was made up almost entirely of Armenians from a single village in Anatolia. And so the, these kind of overlapping orientations and geographies, I think, are really interesting because I have family members who would identify themselves as, as like Yetemsis, you know, from this little, you know, over 100-year-old village, really, in Central California. But, of course, so many of us also then trace back to a further geography. So these, you know, I, I don't even know if they're copies as much as sort of these overlapping kinds of, um, you know, geographic orientations, I think are really, really crucial. But I, 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 I want to steer back away from that. That's a very interesting uh, thought that I think we should keep in mind as we, as we have these conversations, these kinds of overlapping um, geographic orientations. Um, you know, as I think about Turkey, obviously, uh, you know, there's some really crucial differences between what we're talking about in, in these other places. Um, you know, first and foremost, of course, there is no kind of quota system, you know, so there are Armenian parliamentarians in Turkey, or although I suppose um, singular now with the, the untimely death of Mark Aryasayan. Um, but those are not representatives of Armenians in any straightforward sense, right? Not in the sense that they are in Lebanon or in Iran, where there are allocations for Armenians based off of, you know, ethnicity, uh, you know, sectarian orientation, party, whatever it might be, there is a kind of, you know, representative quality that does not exist in Turkey because of the way those parliament, you know, the seats in parliament are filled. So I think that that's a really um, interesting and crucial difference that leads us to, you know, one of my, you know, kind of favorite hobby horses of the question of representation, right? If we're talking about to what extent are Armenians represented 
uh, at the level of government in each of these different countries, then there are some significant differences uh, between Turkey and the other, um, you know, the other countries we have on the table here, right? The, the extent to which Garo Pylon can be a, a representative of Armenians in Turkey is fundamentally different than any of the parliamentarians in Lebanon or in Iran, right? So I think that's, a, that's an important um, attribute to think about when we're considering the investment in institutions uh, by the Armenians within the Republic of Turkey compared to these other locations. That said, um, I, I love solely the question of this kind of um, participation in uh, you know, uh, perpetuity and um, reduplication of institutions, because I think that that's a really important question, even um, or perhaps even especially for Armenians in Turkey. And um, you know, Harag, I think we'll probably have lots to talk about uh, on this question when our time comes. But I know one of the things that I'll spend some time talking about uh, is what are called the vakifs, um, which is often translated as religious foundations. Um, I know they're, they're found throughout the Middle East, especially former Ottoman lands. Um, but in Turkey, they have been codified in a really interesting way such that all of what are uh, quite euphemistically called community foundations, um, the community vakifs in Turkey, uh, were grandfathered in from the Ottoman era and are kept separate from other newer foundations, which then creates a kind of um, little island of non-Muslim vakifs that are grouped together in ways that don't always make sense. And only within the last couple decades, um, 2008, I believe, was when there was a first uh, first appointed somebody who represented all of the non-Muslim foundations in Turkey. This includes not only Armenian foundations, but Greek, uh, you know, Jewish, Assyrian, Syriac, uh, a number of different foundations. So that creates some new kind of possibilities for um, for the investment in institutions. And then the last thing I would say on that topic is that the investment in the institution of the Vakif is quite split among the Armenians in Turkey because there is a, a group, we could even say perhaps a class of Armenians in Turkey who benefit greatly from the way the Vakif system is set up right now and especially the way that it, each Vakif is administered. And each Vakif is administered a little bit differently. And so there are people, individuals, families, dynasties at this point, we could say, who um, benefit sometimes in quite explicitly material ways from the way the Vakif system is, is set up right now, even if it sort of pigeonholes uh, Armenians overall into this little subsection of the bureaucracy. Whereas there has been a push for a kind of democratic um, a, a, a democratization of the way the Vakifs are run uh, and a standardization of the way the Vakifs are run, which would, again, benefit certain groups of Armenians to the detriment of others. So there, then, we also get a, a very explicit uh, look at how the investment in specific institutions uh, is not uniform even among the Armenians of Turkey, right? So I, I would say in some ways this is one of the, the most crucial institutional uh, investments that Armenians have in the, the bureaucracy and the government of Turkey, and, and it becomes a kind of contested uh, battleground um, over those institutional, um, the, the, you know, who, who holds the reins to those institutions and how they get used. Um, so I, I love this question of investment in institutions. I think it's a really wonderful way to get at a number of uh, things that are happening in each of these different communities. That's what, that's what I would sort of speak to. Um, Harag, I don't know what you think about that or if you've got other, other institutions to think through. Yeah, thank you very much, Chris. Um, I'll I'll try to tie that um, to to the to the question uh, Huri Huri asked about Armenians in each of these countries um, defending or trying maintaining the systems. Um, and I'll, I'll start that I'll start my uh, I start my thoughts about that by um, coming back to uh, to your point, Chris, about who represents Armenians uh, in Turkey uh, and. Unofficially, um, but traditionally, um, 
the representatives of Armenians of Turkey is the Patriarchate um, of Istanbul. Uh, and so I say unofficially because th th that's nowhere written, uh, but, if, but the Patriarch and his, you know, symbolically is the representative. And so um, he is the one who uh, writes letters to the prime minister, to the president, and he's the one uh, who is approached uh, by, by the state uh, and by, by the prime minister whenever need be and so on and so on. Uh, and so um, what concerns Armenians um, maintaining, defending or challenging the system, um, I, I, would, I, would, I would say the system in question here is probably the system, the minority dash majority system of, of, of the Republic of Turkey. So who's the minor, who are the minorities and who, who's the majority? And, and I think that is uh, the system where, um, where you know, Armenian stances vis-a-vis uh, -vis that system come, comes in. Um, and according to the, you know, uh, Turkish system of minorities or majority versus majority versus the majority uh, minorities are you know based on the Treaty of Lausanne, which inherited the millet system to some considerable extent, are the non-Muslims, and so it's uh, it's ex explicitly written in the Treaty of Lausanne when the only places the only three or four articles that speak about minorities and minority rights, um, they are all entitled non-Muslim minority. So every single time the word uh, minority comes, it is always pre preceded by the non-Muslim, uh, you know, the description uh, or adjective. Um, and so accordingly, uh, the minorities and the or officially accepted and acknowledged minorities are the um, religious minorities, um, speak mainly the Jews, the Armenians, the Greek, um, less so, but uh, in the recent decades, uh, they got more even, they got somehow recognize the, the Assyrians as well. Um, and accordingly, they are represented, as I said, by their religious figures. Now, when it comes to maintaining or defending this system, the Armenian church and the officially represented, represented community um, has some issue of maintaining this system, uh, but not towards or not or defending it not from really the state um, or the majority that is the Muslim Turkish majority. Um, on the contrary, the state has uh, consistently um, worked worked towards keeping the Armenians and keeping Armenianness uh, within the boundaries of religion and within the boundaries of communal of a communal religious identity and especially uh, making its best to um, to stop any potential uh, ethnicis ethnicization or nationalization or politicization of that identity. And so in that sense, keeping it in the religious boundaries. So that is the boundaries, that is the limits of being an Armenian. I will speak more, I can speak more about this uh, when the time comes. Um, but so there is some issue of defending this system, uh, but from whom? Uh, interestingly enough, from some other Armenians, um, and some Armenians who somehow challenge um, this uh, very religious, very communal or communitarian understanding of Armenian identity and communal religious representation of it through the patriarchate or through the patriarch. And these are, first of all, the minority within the minority um, who are the secularist um, minority uh, within the Armenians of Istanbul, within the Armenians of Turkey, um, mainly emerging since the late 1990s with Agos Hranting, um, then Hranting Foundation after his assassination. Um, so these these people who who try and about which also uh, Chris Chris mentioned the attempts of democratizing the Vakas as well. And so these people who are behind behind that behind that movement trying to somehow. Um, counter uh, this status quo, or this you know, uh, this hegemony of the patriarchate, and saying that you know, trying to bring another representation of the Armenian community through other means, through their newspapers and through their links, very active links with some other democratic um, uh, factions of Turkish and Kurdish society. So that's on the one hand, and the, on the on the other hand, uh, the, the 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 patriarchate and the traditional leadership of the community does uh, somehow has always shown some um, reaction to this. Um, of course, which is which could be partly uh, explained by their politics and you know instrumental politics of you know keeping the power in their hands, but it is also I think also it has some genuine concern behind it as well. 
And the other, and I will finish here, and the other direction, the other challenge that comes to this system um, is uh, it comes from the Muslim Armenians uh, and the Alevi Armenians who claim uh, Armenianness uh, without being, uh, without being uh, Christian uh, and explicitly and openly uh, ch challenge uh, the Christian Armenians and this very much religious understanding of Armenian is saying that we are Armenians, you are not the ones to decide whether we are Armenians or not. Uh, we, we are Armenians and we don't think of, well, some of them do think of becoming Christian again and converting, that is one side of the story, but some of them say, we, we don't think of becoming Christian uh, because we still are Armenians. And this is uh, this has much, uh, much uh, harsher reaction from the established community and its establishment, its religious establishment, who think, uh, who are very much, uh, you know, concerned about this, uh, about this movement, thinking that this jeopardizes, first of all, their authority, but also Arme their, 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 their Armenianness itself, their Armenian identity, which is very much based on religiousness, and importantly, very much based on its diff uh, on the difference and on the contrast uh, with the majority of Turkish society, and that is Islam, that is Muslim. And so, if an Armenian can be a Muslim, then where does the boundary between us Armenians and the others Turks? Uh, what what does what does become of it? And so as a as a result, yes, as a reaction to that, yes, they do defend the system. Coming back to Huri's question, they do defend the minority majority system uh, within Turkey, which sees it through a purely religious lens. That's uh, where I would I would stop here, but I'm I'm sure we could stop. We could we could talk more about this, discuss more of this mm -hmm. when the time comes to speak about the Armenians of of mm -hmm. Turkey, uh, where there is yet another also dimension of Armenianness, and that consists of the migrants from the Republic of Armenia uh, coming to uh, Turkey mm -hmm. as well since the 90s. Yeah. Maybe it's time now um, to take um, questions um, so, from uh, the attendees. Yeah, we can, I think we should, uh, Harag, if you agree, take just one question because of the time issue. Uh, but I think uh, we're on our way to having two, ama two more amazing uh, sessions because we've hit on so many issues that we don't have time for uh, now. But I think already we've had an amazingly fruitful conversation. Uh, uh, what do you think, Sorry, Harag? Just I... one question? Yes. Yeah, Sorry, can I ask, uh, can I just ask a very quick question to Joan. Sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. The um, question is, does she have a quick answer? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <very quick. laughs> no, I was wondering if you know, um, if after the blast, um, uh, uh, Lebanese Armenians uh, decided to move back to, or move to Armenia. Uh, uh, and yeah. I have heard that some have. Um, I'm talking to some my my the people I'm researching with in Lebanon, and she actually knows a few families who have. So I'm trying to trace that out, and um, only very recently. And if I'm not mistaken, some also moved to Artsakh, Varapa. I've heard that. I, I haven't connected with them myself, but I've heard that they moved basically right. I I had heard through someone they moved right before the conflict started. Right. Okay. Right. Um, just to follow on that very quickly, and then I'm going to take the question. Um, yes, many of them come, in fact, and that is really becoming increasingly a trend. Um, I can see that here in Yerevan. I mean, every other week I see some, uh, I see a new face I used to see in Murchamud or in, in Beirut generally, uh, and they say, yes, we've moved permanently. And that is really becoming a trend, and uh, Arme Lebanese Armenianness is becoming really more and more visible in the center, uh, in the center of Yerevan. Um, we have one question uh, addressed to uh, Tzolin. Um, the um, it's about it's about the way uh, Tolin you distinguished between community and communities um, in plural uh, at the beginning of your talk. It says you said that there are multiple Armenian communities in the Ottoman Empire, but only one in Lebanon, which was heterogeneous. Though, could you explain the difference between these two, and what analytic consequences are there of thinking one way? Uh, that is community versus the other communities. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, thank you for that question. Um, I will try to be really brief. Um, so I just meant, it, it's funny because 
I'll tell you what I meant and I'll tell you what I think about very quickly after hearing everyone speak uh, as well, because I think it, it, I think that matters as well. So what I meant is that um, places like the Hajan of where, um, you know, back in Anatolia or Sis back in Cilicia or Marash, right? These were places that were quite far away from each other. They spoke their own dialects. They may not have even spoken Armenian um, in the case of, you know, Southern, uh, you know, parts, some villages in, in Cilicia, right? They were uh, monolingual in Turkish, not Armenian. So you had many, many differences and there's no you know, one can think of if there was no genocide, you wouldn't have had these communities come together in an incredibly dense space of Lebanon or of Beirut or of Burjamut for that matter, right? Um, uh, or, or um, you know, on the other side in Mar Mikhail where Hajin is. But what's interesting, um, and that's what I meant by, um, you know, that, it, that there are, they, you have different communities that become one community in Lebanon. And they frankly become one community, community through a, pretty brutal homogenization process by um, a lot of Armenian institutions. So Armenian political parties, the church, uh, the schools, their newspapers, right? Um, that you don't have you know, this difference anymore and you lose the differences actually. But it's interesting to hear actually what all of you are, have also been talking about because you have um, you know, uh, remnants at least, or even uh, I would, uh, in the case of what James is saying, uh, something new, right? Of people trying to find where they came from before, right? Um, and that is a, that I would argue that is a sort of a re-heterogenization of members of the community. I don't know what that means vis-a-vis -vis these heavy-handed, like these heavy-handed institutions. I look at them quite heavy-handed, right, in their, in their way to um, discipline. And I, I know that there is movement within them, but in general, I find the movement not to be so open, right? Um, but that doesn't mean that like the memories that um, Joanne shared uh, wouldn't maybe push against a little bit of what I'm saying. But at the same time, we cannot, um, you know, we cannot bow to the fact that, I and mean, we have to bow to the fact that there was a sort of bulldozing of difference in Armenians um, through the creation of these new centers though, right? So in this creation and this new construction, you actually had a bulldozing of difference, um, which is also quite interesting um, at, at the same time. So um, I hope that that is a little bit more clarifying, but also thinks, it helps us think about these overlapping, um, uh, versions that we're also talking about of home. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Tsolin, uh, Joanne, Harag, especially for this session, but thank you uh, all, Marisa, James, Chris, Harut, uh, for being here today uh, for our session on Lebanon. Thank you all to the uh, attendees uh, as well. Uh, I think uh, this was a great uh, first part to our three-part uh, series, uh, virtual virtual salon uh, on Armenian communities uh, in the Middle East. I look forward to our winter and spring sessions uh, and uh, I hope uh, our attendees will join us uh, again. And I, uh, by the way, I forgot to mention uh, that uh, we had over a hundred uh, registered guests. Um, and um, we will see you again soon. Uh, thank you again. Uh, and this will this has been recorded and will be on our YouTube channel in uh, well next week. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye all. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank bye. you. Bye.